good afternoon, Word of God. Can we stand together as we reverence the reading of His Word? Are you blessed to be in the assembly today? So with a show of hands, how many of you have no power at home? You're still without power. Man, there's a lot of hands. I've asked that question in all three services today, and all three at least half had their hand up. So we pray for those that are out there working the lines trying to restore power. Uh, welcome to lights and air conditioning. We'll just make this service last until we get a report that the power's back on, right? <laughs> if you have your Bibles, if you would, turn with me to Exodus chapter number 3. Our Shreveport campus is still without power. Uh, it's an interesting campus because we have, uh, we can have power in one part of the building and not in another part. And that's the way it is right now on the Shreveport campus. So we, uh, we're expecting a report this evening to give us some kind of idea when the power will be restored. Uh, what we got two days ago is that w there wasn't any promises being made for most of the people of Shreveport Bosch until the end of the week. And I know a lot of people in this humidity and heat are really hurting right now. So let's just pray for those individuals that are out working the lines and trying to get power restored. We appreciate all those that came in from out of town. I think some 2,000 came in. And so... Uh, Things you take for granted until it's not there, right? We've got the Olev Tov Conference coming up Wednesday, so we're believing and trusting God for power to be restored for that to go forward. Uh, but welcome to Air Conditioning and Light, where there's electric power, Holy Spirit power, Word power. Amen. Exodus chapter 3, if you're there, just say amen. We're going to look at it starting in verse number 1. Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse number 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock by the backside or to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And it's here the Lord's going to appear to him. Verse 2, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Let's pray and we'll get into it, okay? Father, we thank you for the ministry gift of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for your word. And I pray right now for all who would be under the sound of my voice, Lord, for those here in our Bozier campus, for those that are watching this live stream right now. We ask, Father, that you would bless our hearing and that by your Holy Spirit we would receive revelation knowledge. We ask you for wisdom and spiritual understanding. Father, give us a conviction of truth. We ask you for words of hope and faith and above all, salvation. And Father, I just ask that you would speak through me what you would have spoken, override what was said in the previous services and my premeditated thought. May your spirit speak by me. May your word be on my tongue. According to Psalm 45, 1, I ask that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word, removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever as we boldly declare that Satan is defeated, we are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, turn and greet two or three people and make them feel welcome. If you see a dad, say Happy Father's Day. Well, good morning and happy Father's Day to all the dads that are watching the live stream and those of you that are present. And no matter where you are in the world, we've got people watching literally from all over the world this morning. I'm not even going to go through the cities because there's too many to list, but I'll, I'll list the ones that are watching from the greatest distance first. Cape Town, South Africa, uh, Bahrain in the Middle East. We've got Louisiana, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, California, Jamaica, Mississippi, South Carolina, Iowa, Wisconsin, 
all watching this morning on YouTube. So let's give all those places a shout out this morning. I'm coming to you today from Bossier City, Louisiana. I had the honor of ministering here this past Wednesday night, and it's so odd because I was supposed to be in Shreveport ministering today, but left here, and we were talking about it uh, Wednesday night after service, and uh, I was like, you know, I'm, we may work this out and come back Sunday to Bossier, and lo and behold, it's Sunday, and I'm back with you guys in Bossier, so I'm just excited about what God, thank you, Chief, I'm so excited about what God is doing in this campus, through this campus, and in this area, and the vision that we have for the future of Bozier, and you guys make that happen, so uh, good to be in Bozier, amen. I know we got some Shreveportians that crossed the river because the power was out on the other side. Welcome to Bozier, all right? We're in part 10 of our series study in Exodus, and last week we began to talk about the almond rod, and this week I want to talk about the shepherd's rod, and we'll continue this likely into uh, next Sunday, just dealing with this rod. Now, there's a statement here in Exodus 3, verse 1, that I want you to underline, circle, or highlight that we'll be uh, dissecting. It, it's, in, it's in chapter 3, verse number 1. We read it before the prayer. Let's revisit verse 1. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Moses was a shepherd, and he had been a shepherd for 40 years before God commissioned him to go into Egypt and to bring the children of Israel out. So Moses' first 40 years, he's in Egypt uh, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He flees Egypt. The next 40 years of his life, he's serving as a shepherd uh, for his father-in-law. And I want you to notice this statement right here in verse 1, where the Bible says, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. If you're one that writes in your Bibles and what have you, if you would just underline or circle this statement, and he led the flock, and he led the flock. Let me hear you say that out loud. And he led the flock, and he led the flock, and he led the flock. So he's a shepherd. And, and there's so much that comes out of this that I want to uh, uh, break down. He led the flock to the backside of the desert, and this is where he comes to the mountain of God. So in essence, he has led the flock to this place where God is. He has led this flock to this place that's known as the mountain of God. Now, he didn't, I don't know what, uh, you know, what, what motivated him when he's leading this flock to come to the backside of this desert where he will come to the mountain of God, but providence and the hand of God has led him to this place where as a shepherd and leading sheep, he's come to the mountain of God. It's very interesting because when God sends him into Egypt, and he brings the children of Israel out of Egypt. Where does he lead them? He leads them to the mountain of God. He leads them to the place where God will give him the blueprints for the tabernacle and will set in motion this journey all the way to the land of promise. All of this would happen when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. It's also interesting to see that God has uh, summoned this shepherd to be one to lead his people out of Egypt. Now, over the course of the last few months, I have asked you to write down four things that pretty much summarize the book of Exodus. And, and once again, if you're just tuning in or here for the first time, I'm going to give you these four things again because they're important in light of what we're going to talk about today. The four things are, number one, Egypt. Egypt represents our sin. It is bondage. Now, I didn't come up with these four things. I'm not that smart. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in the New Testament speaks of the Exodus journey. And this, this, this journey from the wilderness, through the wilderness, from Egypt all the way to the land of promise. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says it serves as our example that we can learn from Exodus. We can learn from this journey. And when you break down the, uh, the, the story of Egypt, the Red Sea, the wilderness, and the promised land, in my opinion, this is the conclusion I come to, that Egypt represents our sin. It represents our bondage that Jesus came to deliver us from. The Red Sea is a picture of our baptism. Again, that's recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where the Bible tells us that the children of Israel were baptized in the Red Sea. It was that place that would eventually sever their ties to Egypt. Once delivered, they would never be able to go back. 
not the way they came out because the waters that God had opened for the children of Israel would return and the Egyptian army was swallowed up in those waters and it's interesting that today you can find chariots and Egyptian armor at the bottom of the Red Sea, physical evidence that the word of God is true. And so the four things that I've asked you to write down is that Egypt is a picture of our sin that we needed salvation from, we needed deliverance from. The Red Sea represents our baptism. Romans 6, 4 tells us that when we follow Jesus in baptism, we are buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. So when you accepted Christ as Savior and you followed him in baptism, that baptism became a picture of your Red Sea where I am being separated from the life I had before Christ under the life I now have in Christ. Now this third point is so vital, especially with what we're going to look at today. And that is, again, the wilderness journey, the wilderness, the desert, because we're in that journey right now. And we've not yet made it to the promised land. It doesn't mean we haven't built goodly houses and ate good and had our bellies full and experienced the blessing of God and the goodness of God. We, we see his goodness, but we've not made it yet to the promised land. Till we get to heaven, till we see Jesus, we've not reached the land of promise. There are some preachers that would tell you the promised land is here, but the promised land is not here. We still live in a fallen world that is broken, and we have to recognize that our world is fallen, but God is so good, he still lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust, but we have to know according to Jesus, this world is going to be filled with persecution, and we will be hated for his namesake, and we have trials, and we have tribulation and trouble, we have peril, we have persecution, we have problems, we have people, come on somebody. We have to deal with all of this on the way to the land of promise. Now, in Exodus chapter 3, we see Moses' resume in that he was a shepherd that had led the flock to the backside of the desert. Now, with this in mind, I want to come to the Gospel of Matthew. Turn with me to Matthew chapter number 9. So God anointed, he, he called this shepherd, Moses, to go in and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and to lead them to the land of promise. Let's talk about a shepherd just for a minute, all right? A shepherd, because we'll be spending just about this whole service dealing with the shepherd. The word shepherd comes from the Hebrew word roha. One of the names of God in the Old Testament is Jehovah roha, the Lord is the Lord my shepherd. It's important to know, though, what that word roha means, which is the Hebrew word shepherd. It actually means feeder or one that feeds and so when you look at the root to the word shepherd it means one that feeds and you think about the 23rd psalm and how that shows up as uh, the role of a shepherd the 23rd psalm says the lord is my shepherd help me if you know the rest of verse one i shall not want why because i have a shepherd the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, what is the first thing we find out about the shepherd in the 23rd Psalm? He, he maketh me to lie down, where? In green pastures, which speaks of feeding and that he leads the shop, the, the flock, the shop, the flock, to, the, the shepherd leads the flock to a place of feeding where they can eat. And then the next thing we read about the shepherd, he, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still water. So now again, that's something that I'm feeding on, something that I'm receiving from nourishment. So the word shepherd, root word uh, to that is a feeder, one that feeds, one that nourishes. Now watch what Jesus says in Matthew chapter number nine, and we'll look at it down in uh, verse 36. Matthew nine, verse 36. If you're there, just say amen. So now Moses is a shepherd. And God calls him to go into Egypt to bring his children out, to lead them through the wilderness, not to the wilderness, through the wilderness, to the land of promise. And God says, I'm going to use a shepherd to do this. I'm going to use a man that has experience defending a flock, feeding a flock, leading a flock, 
ministering to a flock through the desert, that's who I'm going to use to uh, bring my people out. Now, let me give you this parallel real quick. There is, we are compared more to, in Scripture, than sheep. So when God speaks of the relationship that he has with us, his children, there is no uh, greater uh, metaphor, no, no greater parallel than to that of a shepherd and his sheep. Perhaps that's why the 23rd Psalm is so popular, why it resonates in our heart. And, and, and you know, it's, it's one that we're familiar with. You might not be familiar with another psalm, but Psalm 23 is a popular psalm. Because it speaks of the relationship of a shepherd and his sheep. As a matter of fact, not only does it speak of the relationship, it speaks of the seasons of life. When you break down the 23rd Psalm, it, it, it deals with the four seasons of life. It, it literally takes us all the way to the house of God. It's a picture of what Moses led the children of Israel from and to. He led them from bondage in Egypt all the way to the land of promise. And that's what Jesus does for us. Hallelujah. The 23rd Psalm ends with, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. And so I've made it home. I've made it to the promised land. But I didn't just end up in the house of the Lord forever. No, the 23rd Psalm also speaks of the valley of the shadow of death and not being afraid of any evil. It also speaks of a table that we get to set at in the presence of our enemies. And so the 23rd Psalm speaks of seasons of life and hardship and trial and how God is faithful in every season. But at the end, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So at the end of the 23rd Psalm, you're seeing a picture of number four. The, the, the four things we've written down in our study of Exodus is, is I'm home. I'm in the promised land. But, but I'm going through the wilderness to get there. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, watch this in Matthew chapter number, whichever one I told you, chapter 9. And, and, and let's look at it down in verse number 36. But, this is Jesus, but when he saw the multitudes, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Let's read that out loud uh, uh, Wogan Bose, you ready? Read. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Let's just talk about that just briefly. He was moved with compassion on them. Having compassion on someone is empathy. It, 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 it's relating. It's taking someone else's burden personally. It's, it, it's having power at your house and air conditioning at your house and seeing somebody else that doesn't have power and air conditioning and say, hey, come stay in my house. Y'all need that right now, don't we? My house was full last night. We had, we had, we had people piled up on every couch and chair. I mean, you know, we, so, you know, you, you bring somebody in, it's in the heat. Empathy. Thank God for the people in my life that saw my need and had compassion on me. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Jesus has compassion on, on us. Now, that is an act of empathy. And no relationship can fulfill what God ordained it to fulfill without compassion or empathy. I'm saying all this for a reason, all right? So stay with me, all right? Now, I want you to come on. Give me time now. Let me, let me, let me move my pace. All right. So when, 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 when God looked at Adam in the garden and he said it's not good that man should be alone, he saw that there were some voids in Adam's life that could not be met with him being alone. So he said it's not good that man should be alone. Now this is not popular, but it is real. When God made Adam the woman a wife and he brought the wife unto him, from that moment forward, every relationship had its foundation on need. It's so important we understand this. 
when we vent, when we speak of our trial, when we tell our spouse, our, 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 our kids, our neighbor, our friends about our problems and our pain and our hardship, it's not that we just want to vent because I think most of the time when we complain, when we think about it, we're like, you know, I really don't even like complaining. I kind of feel bad that I just complained, right? It, it, am, I, am I the only one? Sometimes I complain. I'm like, what am I doing? I, you know, I need to stop complaining. You see somebody else has got it much worse and you feel bad that you even complained. Anybody but me? Yeah. All right. But why do we do that? And I was actually processing that this morning. Why do we complain? I feel like we're fishing for empathy. We want somebody to relate. Do you, do, do, can someone just be in touch with my feeling right now? I know somebody else has got it worse. Don't throw that at me. Right now in my world, it, it, you know, in my, I'm still hurting. Yeah, there are other people hurting worse. But, you know, I know someone had a tree fall on their house. But I'm still upset that one fell on my car. Does that make sense? So empathy is that longing for someone to be moved. Jesus' compassion was moved on them. This is portrayed in the, uh, in the story of the Good Samaritan where the priest saw the, 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 the man laying and he went by on the other side. And the Levites saw the man and looked on him and went by on the other side. But when the Good Samaritan saw the man laying on the, on the, on the highway side, he went to him and he poured in oil and wine and he clothed him and put him on the back of his beast and took him to an inn where he could get care and paid the innkeeper for, for that man to be taken care of. So what, what happened? In the story of the Good Samaritan, the man is having compassion on the fallen man. He doesn't just look and observe that he's in trouble. He does something about it. Well, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the good shepherd that has empathy on the sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd that loves all of his sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd that sees the 99 safe in the pasture together. They're okay and will go out and find that one that is lost to bring him back because he knows that one is more vulnerable to the wolf than the 99 that are back home together. Come on, somebody. So, so the Bible says here that Jesus had compassion on them. But what was, I, I'm, I'm going somewhere, stay with me. What, what, was, what was churning in him? What was moving in him? The Bible said he had compassion on them. Something is happening inside of him. He's being moved. The mercy of God and the goodness of God and the grace of God are stirring in his being. But what is he moved by? What's wrong with the people? What do they need that has him being moved with compassion on them? Read the rest of that verse out loud, beginning with the word because. Ready? Read because they fainted and were scattered abroad read it out loud as sheep having no shepherd Jesus had compassion when he looked at multitudes of people that are fainting which means they're weary and are scattered sheep are most vulnerable when they are scattered, we in Scripture are compared to sheep. Do you realize when we get disconnected from God, from our Father, it translates into the disconnect we have with others. And you've heard me say it, and it's in our pre-service video, that the cross points vertically and horizontally. And you can't have a vertical relationship with God and then not affect your horizontal relationship with people. If I love God, I love people. Jesus looks at a multitude that have no shepherd and he's moved with compassion. If he's moved with compassion because they have no shepherd, the result would be a shepherd. If you were hungry and I was moved with compassion, then I would do something that you ate. I wouldn't just say, man, I'm sorry you're hungry. Have a good day and then go eat me a Whopper. When Jesus saw the multitude that had no shepherd, when he's moved with compassion, that, that moving 
of compassion is to do something about the people that had no shepherd. And that's what led him in verses 37 and 38 to pray that the Lord would send forth more laborers into his harvest. That's his prayer. He needs more people to take on this role of shepherd. And thank God for the shepherds in our life. Jesus is our chief shepherd, amen, 1 Peter 5 makes that clear, but think about that our parents serve as shepherds, dads on Father's Day serve as shepherds, ministers are shepherds, a pastor by definition is a shepherd, the word pastor is actually rooted in the Hebrew word roi, which means feeder, God said in Jeremiah 3.15, I will give you pastors based on my heart that will feed you with knowledge and understanding, that's what the word pastor means is feeder, one that feeds, feeds, feeds the word of God. When Jesus was speaking to Peter post-resurrection, he said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Lord, why do you keep asking? Because if you love me, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. First Peter chapter 5 Verse 2 says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Then verse 4 says, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, he, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Now, turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. So Jesus sees sheep having no shepherd, and he's moved with compassion on them. This speaks of our need of a shepherd. I know we like being a lone ranger, but we need a shepherd. And the shepherd we ultimately need is Jesus. Hallelujah. And so when it came to leading his people, think about this for a minute. He's leading the children of Israel out of bondage. And what God knew would be a 40-year journey to the promised land. And who does he call, equip, and send to do this? A shepherd. Yeah. Moses. He said, I, I, my people are as stubborn as sheep. So I'm, I'm going to use a shepherd that can relate. A shepherd that can understand. The 23rd Psalm speaks so much to our life. And Lord willing, we'll go over there here in a minute and just kind of dig into a few points. And, uh, and also, Lord willing, on a Wednesday coming up, perhaps this uh, next few months, we're going to be uh, doing a study of the 23rd Psalm. But watch this in the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. If you're there, just say amen. There, here, it's here that Jesus is portraying himself as the shepherd. He's speaking that terminology, that, that he is the good shepherd. We'll look at it starting in verse number 10. If you're there, say Amen. John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Look at what he says in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The, 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 the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now he's going to contrast the difference between a shepherd and a hireling. A hireling would be one the shepherd would hire to help manage the fold. Now, if it got bad enough, the hireling might say, you ain't paying me enough for this, and run. So if a wolf comes into the fold and the hireling says, wait a minute, I'm not going to get eaten by no wolf protecting these sheep. Man, you don't pay me enough for this. My life is on the line. So Jesus is contrasting a man that is paid to do something versus a true shepherd. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I'm not in this for my gain. Boy, y'all let that go right. I cannot be with it. J Jesus, not me. Jesus said, I'm not doing this for my gain. Jesus laid down his life for you and me. Everything that he does is for our gain. He doesn't need us to be who he is. We need him to be who we are. Jesus is not a hireling. In other words, there's no amount of anything that we give to him that makes him savior. I don't pay him to be my savior. He is my savior. There's nothing I can give that would move him to say, oh, now I'll bless you. Now I'll save you. No, no, no. What I give is in response to what he's already given. And it's not a repayment because he is a shepherd, not a hireling. 
So he says that the hireling, verse 12, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd who's owned the sheep or not, he sees the wolf coming. And what does he do to the sheep? He gone. And you probably have people like that in your life. See, a hireling is hired. A hireling is in relationship for the payment. If I'm hired, that means you're going to pay me for what I agree to. I'm going to be compensated. There are people that will come in your life as hirelings. You may not literally pay them and sign a check and give it to them, but there is something in your life that they see they can gain from. But when the wolf comes, they flee because they weren't really for you. They were for what they could get from you. And once they realize that, 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 that what they're facing, you know, uh, is more severe, that, uh, that ain't worth it. And they're going to be, say, I hate to say this. I've been in ministry all my adult life. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to happen. I've seen it too many times. People will come in your life, coattail your life, act like they love you and everything until the wolf comes and then they go when they don't think they can get anything else from you or when they got what they were after in the first place. That's a hireling. Sad but true. Jesus said, I'm not the hireling. I didn't come into your life to see what I get from you. I'm not using you. Oh, hallelujah. He's the true shepherd. He said, I'm the good shepherd. I give my life for you. I'm not the hireling. The hireling will run when the wolf comes. But I show up when the wolf comes. And what does he show up with? He shows up with his rod. And that's why his rod and his staff bring comfort to me. Is that I know that no matter what might come unto my life in this wilderness, I have a good shepherd that has my back. I have a good shepherd whose goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. I have a good shepherd that makes me lie down in green pastures. I have a good shepherd that feeds me by the still waters. I have a good shepherd that will prepare a table for me even in the presence of my enemies. Now, they're not at my table. They got picked off in the valley. There are going to be people that are not going to walk through every season of life with you. But when you get to your table, God will make sure they see it. <laughs> That's the 23rd Psalm. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And that table, by definition, is actually a flat land that's real high and lifted up. It can be a metaphor of our furniture, four-legged piece of furniture table. But, but biblically, the table was a high range, a mountain area that a shepherd would lead his sheep to. But to get to that table, in most cases, they had to go through a valley to get there. And so we have to recognize that every season of our life is not going to necessarily be a table there are going to be seasons in our life that we're going through that valley of the shadow of death and we we have to realize that 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 valley will cause things in your life that don't need to be in your life before you get to the table to come out of your life and that includes people god may be taking you somewhere right now in your life that others that have been clinging to you can't go to And the trial will pull them out. There may be mindsets or habits or addictions or sin in your life that God can't take to the table. And so the valley will get it out of you. I need the Lord in every area of my life. I need Jesus as my shepherd in every area of my life. Why? Because he knows where he's taking me and he knows the best route to get there. Now watch this in, in, in John 10, and, and let's finish this up. So he says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd, the, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that's a hireling, but not the shepherd, who's owned the sheep or not, he sees the wolf and he leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catcheth them and scatters the sheep. There's a prophecy, I think, in Zerah that says, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Verse 13, the hireling fleeth because he's a hireling and, not, and careth not for the sheep. He doesn't really care for the sheep. He's just there because he's paid to be there. 
Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. So Jesus said, not only do I know my sheep, they know me. Well, what signifies that we belong to the Lord and that he is our shepherd? What signifies that? Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Let's read that out loud. Ready? Read. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Jesus said what separates my sheep is that they have been earmarked. And for thousands of years, that's been uh, the culture of shepherds and uh, men that own cattle is to put an earmark in their herds so that they could be identified to a certain shepherd. And there are cultures where the shepherd would take a knife and lay the ear and put a certain cut in the ear of the sheep. And by that mark, if that sheep got loose, another shepherd would find that sheep, look at the mark on the ear and say, oh yeah, that belongs down the road. And then the ear mark signified who the sheep belonged to. Jesus said, my sheep, here's what separates them. They know my voice. My sheep know my voice. If you struggle to hear God's word, if you feel like you're not hearing from him in your heart, then, then check your salvation. I don't say that to be condemning. I'm just letting you know that if you have no desire to hear the word of God and you're not sensitive to the voice of his spirit, there could only be one problem. You're not saved. I'm not saying that to be condemning. That was me. Even in our sin, conviction is his voice. 1 John 3 says, if my heart condemns me, I feel guilty, I'm broken by my sin. If my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart and knows all things. Which means I don't look at conviction and say, oh man, I'm lost. You know, uh, I don't have salvation. No, conviction is a good thing. I need to hear from God when I'm wrong. I need to have a lack of peace in my inner being when I'm outside the will of God. I need to know his voice because his voice is what's going to give me direction. Now, with this in mind, let's go back to Deuteronomy or over to Deuteronomy. And I want to go to the 8th chapter, Deuteronomy chapter number 8. So Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. And his voice can be a convicting voice, a correcting voice. Nobody likes correction. Hebrews 12, 11 says, now no chastening or correcting for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. So when we are corrected or convicted or disciplined, it's not joyous, but it's grievous. However, verse 11 of Hebrews 12 goes on to say, Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. In other words, the correction in my life for today is preparing me for God's plan tomorrow. That's a part of being shepherded. That's, a, that's, that, that's the shepherding process. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. What does that mean? Correct, correct what needs to be corrected in your children's life why there's time ahead of them. Correction that God brings in our life today is always for what he has for our future. So when I feel like I'm convicted, you know, and, and the Lord is really dealing with me right now in my life, that is not because this is the end. That's because he's got a place he's going to take you to, and this needs to get out of your life based on where he's taking you to. So being earmarked, you know, by God and the Lord being my shepherd it is it, it, to not only receive, you know, direction and uh, him leading me in the paths of righteousness, which the 23rd Psalm speaks of, that his name 
uh, for his name's sake, that his name be glorified. This whole process of the Lord being my shepherd through the good, the bad, the ugly, the hard, the easy, all of that is because of the future that, that God has for me. Now watch Deuteronomy 8. Because we can get to the table. We can get to what we call our promise. Walking in the manifest blessing of God, where we're seeing God's blessing in every area of our life, mentally, physically, spiritually, financially. Oh man, I couldn't have dreamed of living this life. And you feel like you've arrived. Your kids, they don't know it any other way. You try to tell them what it was like when you grew up, and they can't relate. They don't understand what a pager was. You're like, look, my mama paged me. You're like, pager, what's that? You're like, my, my mama paged me codes. It wouldn't even be a number, be a code. You know, I, I'd look at the number and go, ah, I got to go, man. My mama got a page, man. People don't went off. You know, young people don't even know what that is. You got to go Google all that. What is, what is the world is that? That's, that's before the iPhone. Matter of fact, when cell phones did finally come out, you know, and you had to carry that big car battery around if you wanted one, you move around. Man, I had me one of them. I thought I was bad going up in Burger King, set that thing up on the table. I didn't have room for my food. Had that little cord. I'm like, hello? Now, I had to have them hang up after one minute. It was about $6 a minute back then, man. You know, they hung up, but I still act like I'm on the phone. Vain self. <laughs> Ain't nobody there. My pager went off, man. Give me, a, give me to a phone. Kids don't know about them days, man. It was a day. Watch this in Deuteronomy chapter 8. So we can walk in that goodness. We can walk in the harvest. And we can forget that this table we're on wasn't always the way it was. And so watch what Deuteronomy chapter 8 says. And we'll look at it in verse number uh, 10. Deuteronomy 8 verse number 10. You get there to say amen. When thou hast eaten and art full. I ate and I'm happy, I'm content, and full, ready to take a nap. Then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given thee. So I've eaten, I'm full, I'm living a good life, good land. He said, bless the Lord. Verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Verse 12. Lest or unless when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. Are y'all with me? I'm, I'm eating good. I'm living good. Nice house. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is what? Multiply. So I'm walking in increase. And all that thou hast is multiplied. I used to have one hammer, now I've got two. You, know, you, you see what I'm saying? I used to multiply. I used to have one pot to cook in, now I've got eight. See, I'm, 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 I'm multiplying. Verse four, 14. Then thine heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now watch this. Now, let me stop before I get to verse 15. Because he, 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 he's painting the picture of you're living in a nice house, you're eating good, you're living good, everything you have is multiplied, things you used to have one of, now you have several of, your gold is multiplied, your silver is multiplied, you actually got a savings account, back then you couldn't even imagine having a savings account, you were just trying to keep enough money in the account that stuff would get through. You're trying to catch a check with a check. So he's portraying, you've, you, you've come to a better place. And now you've got it so good that it's easy for your heart to be lifted up and forget it wasn't always this way. And that's verse 15. So watch this, verse 15. Who led thee, who led thee. Through that great and terrible what? Wilderness. So I've been through some stuff. That, that, that's that journey that we've been talking about. Egypt's my sin. 
Red Sea is my baptism. Now I'm walking with the Lord, but I'm still in the wilderness. But look, God is faithful in that wilderness, verse 15, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna. The word manna in Hebrew means what? Because that was their response when bread fell from the sky. What? And God will do things in your life and leave you saying, what? I mean, look at God. What? I mean, just like, man, what? To, to, to think that, 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 that God is, is, is so good and he, and, and he does things that you know he did for you, whether he did it through someone or not. You're like, man, God, only you. What? Oh, man, what, God? Oh, man, what? I mean, you're just like, and just in awe of, of, of the Lord's faithfulness and his blessing on your life. You're like, what? I mean, God, how how could you only go? What? I mean, I pulled up on the Bozier campus and we're like, what? I mean, this is a beautiful place. I'm like, what? Man, we just not have a church to meet in. Now we got two power out and one, we just go to the other. I mean, God is, God is good. I mean, I was like, I was having a what moment this morning. Like, what? Just thinking about the faithfulness and goodness of God. But it wasn't always this way. And I know I'm talking to somebody. When you look at your life, you think back. It wasn't always this way. Verse 16. He, he, he fed me with, with things and let me say, and what? He, 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 he fed me with manna. Verse 16 says, stuff my daddy didn't even know about. My mom and daddy didn't see God move like this. He said, I, I minister to you in ways that your fathers didn't even see me move in. Hallelujah. Generational blessing that was new to your family. Hey, isn't that good on Father's Day? That God will do something in your life that had never existed in your family before. Your daddy never knew that. Your mama never saw that. But he did it with you. That's a good God. He said, I did things your father didn't even know about. That he might humble thee. That he might prove thee. Oh, I love that. That he might humble thee, that he might prove thee. See, God's leading me through seasons that will take things out of me that don't belong. Because he wants me in a certain condition when I arrive in his, the land he's called me to abide in. See, God will let you make small mistakes. I mean, big mistakes, but he'll make you do them in small rooms. And he'll get all that mess out of you because it can't. Like some of you want to get married right now, but you can't get married right now because you got stuff that, that won't work in a marriage. No, oh, there we go. I felt that one. Oh, yeah, that's good. Now, the Bible says it's better to, better to marry than to, than to burn, which means with lust. But that can't be the only motive for you getting married. If you can't deal with your lust problem being single, don't think being married is going to end it. You got a bigger problem if you got lust in your marriage. Everybody good? He will humble me. And then watch this. He will prove me. I love that one because this is the Lord saying, let, 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 let me prove you. Let me prove you. And this is not that God needs to see me respond to him in a certain way in trial because the Lord sees my end from the beginning. So God doesn't have to prove me for him. He proves me for me. In other words, the Lord will bring you through some things you didn't think you could go through so that you could see your faith and that you could see what he would do in your life in that season. Hallelujah. And when you finally get to that place of breakthrough, then, 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 then listen to me. It won't change you because you, you know what you went through to get there. Other folk may say, well, you just serve the Lord because no, 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 no. You didn't know me then. If you didn't know me then, you'd know there ain't nothing changed in my life. So he says, I, I, I led you through it to humble you and to prove you. Look at the last statement in verse 16. Read it out loud. To do thee good at thy latter end. 
And that's exactly how the 23rd Psalm ends is, is I'm dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. He will do me good at the latter end. He sees where he's taken me to. So he says in verse 17, and thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. No, no, no. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And then he goes through these next two verses, encouraging us never to turn after other gods and to serve them. But the beauty of what he's saying in the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy is that I've led you through some things. I was your shepherd in those days. I walked with you. I walked with you. I was there. I was present I fed you I worked things in your life that no one before you ever knew and, and, and when I bring you to this place that you have envisioned and you had written on your vision board and it looks like you have arrived don't you forget that I've been your shepherd not when it was just good I was your shepherd when it was bad I led you through this no wonder I'm closing no wonder Jesus looked at the multitudes that were weary and scattered and had compassion on them because they had no shepherds we need shepherds. I need a shepherd. I need Jesus. I need Jesus in every season of my life. I need Jesus. I need a shepherd. I need a shepherd. There's no season, no, no valley. I don't need him. And I need him as much on that table as I did in that valley. Because without him in that valley, the, 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 that death would have swallowed me up. But on that table, pride would have swallowed me up had I not had him. Either way, I'd have been destroyed without him. I need a shepherd. I need a shepherd to speak to my heart. I need a shepherd that will speak to me and lead me and guide me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And God will do things in our lives for his name's sake. What does that mean? That means the condition of our lives is a reflection on our owner. The Lord said, I'm going to do things in your life because you are a reflection of me. And I'm going to lead you in the paths of righteousness. And I'm going to do it for my name's sake. I'm going to do things in your life so I can get some glory. Come on, somebody. Amen. Anybody here need a shepherd? Let me pray for you this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray, Father, in this moment right now, for those here gathered in this assembly, for those watching this live stream, that we would see the season of our lives right now. And our need of you. We need a shepherd. With every head bowed, all eyes closed. When we quote the 23rd Psalm and we say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It doesn't mean that Jesus meets every want we have because he can change your want. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior right now, he is moved with compassion on you. When I think back on my life and what the Lord has done for me and the seasons he's walked me through and the things I've witnessed in other believers, it's left me with this wonder again and again and again, this wonder, how do people make it without He's faithful in every season. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Father, give us an ear to hear what your spirit is speaking to our lives. In Jesus' name. We acknowledge our need of a shepherd. You may be in a place right now where you're looking for direction. I was ministering to a young man once and he said, Pastor, I know I'm supposed to do this. And I said, how do you know? He said, because this door opened. And I said, but what would you do when many doors open? 
every open door is not a sign it's God. We need to know which door. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. What does that even mean? Sheep don't willingly lie down. Because when they lie down, they're most vulnerable to the wolf or to the predator. Because of their body weight and the proportion to their legs, it's hard for them to get up. So they're skittish. They're scared. If they lie down, that means they have peace. Maybe you're right now in a place where you're not lying down. You can't sleep at night. You're anxious about everything. And the place that he makes us to lie down is green pastures. He doesn't make us lie down in the valley. That's not the place he led us to. That's what he's leading us through. So don't set up camp in this broken place, this broken season of your life. And know that you're going to get to a place that's a green pasture. And he's going to take away every fear so that you can lie down. And you'll be in no rush. You'll be still and know that he is God. And you'll be able to drink out of still waters. Why? Running water can drown sheep. And sometimes we get drowned in the chaos and the confusion of a busy, demanding life. And God's saying, I'm going to make you lie down. You're not going to have any fear, and you're going to enjoy this pasture. And I got for you still waters that are easy for you to drink with no risk. We're so busy. We're missing the shepherd. And if you go on and grab a can of Red Bull because you got so much and you need this energy, and you're drinking something that's going to constrict your blood vessels to make your heart pump harder so your body will wake up because you're putting a strain on your system and you feel alert but what you're really doing is you're just strangling your system just so you can have the energy to do one more thing I'm speaking to you it's time to lie down in green pastures there's a shepherd that has a better life than us trying to chase down something else and complete one more thing on our to-do list and the voice of the taskmaster is just ringing in our ears and we can't get settled and we can't be still. We need a shepherd. And Jesus is looking at you right now and he is moved with compassion because he knows that without him, we, we are weary. We are weary. We, we, we are scattered. We're running all over the place. We need a shepherd. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. So, Father, I pray right now for the person assembled here, for the individuals watching live that need a shepherd. For those that are lost and have never known Jesus, may this be the day of their salvation. For those that know the Lord but aren't listening and aren't making time to hear his word, Lord, give us a conviction today to want to hear from you. In Jesus' name. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge my need of the Good Shepherd. I call on Jesus to be the Savior of my life. Save me from my sin from my past, from myself. Give me an ear to hear 
what your spirit is saying. Open my heart to receive your word. To walk in the fruit of the life you have for me. Lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Do things in my life that will bring you glory. And in every season, help me to remember, you are my shepherd. I shall not want. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap offering for his goodness this morning? Hallelujah. Listen, if you need prayer for any reason, we've got many women down front, and they just love to pray with this morning. That's what they're here for. Before we dismiss, let me just make a, a one or two quick announcements. Olive Tav is to start this coming Wednesday. It will be on both campuses, Shreveport and Bossier. Doors will open one hour early. I know some of you don't want to go through that, but that's the way it's going to be. It will be the, for the first time ever live streamed. Our, our viewing audience can watch Olive Tav for the first time ever. It's going to be glorious. Starts this coming Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday going to be a magnificent conference. Jeremiah Woods is going to be here on the opening night, and I've seen his set list, and it's going to be on fire. So we want to see you there. Invite somebody. For those of you watching at home, invite people over, cook up something real good, and watch it on, uh, on live, right? Let's stand together. Happy Father's Day to all of our dads in the house. If you need prayer for any reason, come forward. Hey, let's pray for those that are serving our community to get the power back up. Let's be sensitive to those that are in need. If you know someone that might be at home burning up in need, reach out to your loved ones. Reach out to the elderly in our community. Let's not let anybody be hurting. Let's be moved with compassion, right? Amen. If you need prayer, come forward. Otherwise, you are dismissed. See you Wednesday night. Have a blessed week.